<clears throat> okay, we are in session four of the book of Isaiah. Title of the lesson is God Reigns, and it is Isaiah 23. So session four, God Reigns, Isaiah 23. So using the outline over here, so far we have looked at rebuke and promise from the Lord, which is Isaiah chapter 1 through chapter 6. Uh, if you remember, the first four chapters of Isaiah kind of alternates between God's rebuke of his people and promising restoration. Uh, once they have been judged and punished, he's going to bring them back and reestablish them again in Jerusalem. And then chapter 6 was Isaiah's call to uh, the prophetic ministry. Then last couple of weeks, we had done the promise of Emmanuel, chapter 7 through chapter 12. And last week's lesson, we talked about the uh, threat of Aram, which is today Syria in the northern kingdom, invading Judah. And King Ahaz's refusal to ask for a sign from God that things were going to work out. Instead, he did what? Said no, said no thanks and did what? Went ahead and worshiping the idols. Now, who did you join up with? Oh. Starts with an A. Syria. You made an alliance with Assyria oh. instead of Assyria. taking God's words that the guys above were not going to be able to conquer them. So that was last week. This week, we're basically right here, chapter 13 through chapter 23, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. We're not going to do all 10 chapters, by the way. <laughs> we're going to take that group, and we're just going to really do chapter 23. But uh, before we get started, I have a question for you. I have some props here, and I want you to look at them, and I want you to tell me what they have in common. And you're going to have to think about this one because it's not maybe initially uh, obvious. So I have a two-pound weight. Those of you that ever had to have physical therapy, you'll be familiar with these little weights, you know, up and down. So I got a two-pound weight. Got a set of car keys. Got an iPhone. I got a checkbook. Can anybody figure out what they all have in common? Checkbook, iPhone, weight, and car keys. Power. Good job. What did you say? Power. Oh, good well, for you. I did not expect anybody to get that. So, Bert, congratulations. You, my surprise for the day. I was going to say paperweights. <laughs> paperweights may work, too. Because you have power over your car with your keys, yeah. and your checkbook, and your phone, and the weight mm -hmm. gives you power. They all represent power in some form. So weights, you use a weight to, for physical power to get your strength back from physical therapy. You use your iPhone because it gives you the power to make phone calls. If, if you've got a smartphone, it gives you the power to get on the information highway. Your keys give you power over your car. And your checkbook hopefully gives you financial power to do what you need to do. So they all represent power. And what we're talking about today is power too in Isaiah. But we're talking about political power. And if you if in some way you have missed all of the ads for the last six months, we are right in the midst of a political power struggle as to who's going to be running the government for the next four years, state, local, and national. And in the book of Isaiah, we're going to talk about who's going to be ruling Judah and what's going to happen to all the nations around Judah politically in the coming years. Um, 
We're going to look at chapters 13 through 23, and like I said, we're not going to look at all of it. We're going to look at basically chapter 23. But this section of Isaiah is referred to by biblical scholars as the oracles against the nations. Because every one of those chapters is God's judgment through Isaiah over a nation that surrounds Judah. So, for instance, in chapters 20, uh, 13 and 14, it's God's judgment on the Babylonian Empire. Well, Assyria is the current threat. Babylon will eventually overtake them, but then Babylon itself will be overtaken. So chapters 13 and 14 is about the Babylonians um, being judged. 15 and 16 talks about a little country called Moab, which um, you may have heard the Moabites sometimes when you study the other places in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, you'll hear the Moabites. So this is their nation. Uh, 17 is Syria and Israel. 18 to 20, he talks about Egypt and Cush. And Cush could be either Ethiopia or uh, Nubia, which was a kingdom south of Egypt during this time frame. Uh, tw chapter 21 is Arabia. Chapter 22 is Jerusalem. And 23 is against a nation called Tyre, or a city called Tyre. So basically, it's God's judgment against all the nations that surround Judah. And he's trying to, through Isaiah, let his people know that, yes, these are the nations I'm going to use to judge you, but they're also going to be judged as well. Because none of these guys were worshiping God. Most of them worshiped Baal or some other Middle Eastern deity of the time. So they were not religiously uh, connected with God, but God was using the pagan nations to judge his people because of their rebellion. And the city of Tyre is going to be the example that we're going to look at today. So chapter 23, I'm going to read the first seven verses, which we're not going to really talk about. But the first seven verses of chapter 23 are kind of the, here's the judgment that's going to happen. So in the Holman edition, chapter 23, 1 to 7, says the following. An oracle against Tyre, oracle meaning prophecy. Well, ships of Tarsh, for your haven has been destroyed. Word has reached them from the land of Cyprus. Mourn inhabitants of the coastland, you merchants of Sidon. Your agents have crossed the sea on many waters. Tyre's revenue from the grain from Shehor, the harvest of the Nile. She was the merchant among the nations. Be ashamed, Sidon, the stronghold of the sea, for the sea has spoken. I have not been in labor or given birth. I have not raised young men or brought up young women. When the news reaches Egypt, they will be in anguish over the news about Tyre. Cross over to Tarshish, whale, the inhabitants of the coastline. Is this your jubilant city, whose origin was in ancient times, whose feet have taken her to settle far away. The description here is basically of the dis destruction of the city of Tyre. So let's look into what we follow along with. So starting with Isaiah 23, 8. Mike, could you read 23, verse 8, please? Who has turned the steps against Tyre to the store of Tyre? whose merchants were princes, whose traders were the honor of the earth. Okay. And the Holman, verse 8, says, who planned this against Tyre? It's a rhetorical question. He's going to actually answer it in the next verse. But since these are God's judgments, it's pretty uh, obvious that the person who planned this was God. But who was Tyre? Well, Tyre was a trading center, as you may glean from the first seven verses. Tyre was a trading center located to the north of Judah on the coast. It was a Phoenician uh, city, part of the Phoenician Empire of the time. And it was a commercial center. 
um, again, you may have gleaned that from those first seven verses. They were traitors. And they were extremely wealthy, and they were extremely proud of the fact that they were trading sinner and wealthy people. Um, who planned this against Tyre? This is something that's going to come in the future. The this is not right now. It's something that will happen later that Isaiah is seeing. So he's foretelling here, not forthtelling. And in fact, Tyre would be attacked three times in history. Uh, the Assyrians would attack and lay siege to the city. The Babylonians would attack and lay siege to the city. And none of them would actually destroy the city. They were not, the city was not taken and sacked until Alexander the Great in the 300, early 300s BC. So we're looking at three or 400 years in the future before the city is actually destroyed. So Isaiah is looking quite a distance into the future. But again, just look at what it describes Tyre. Tyre is the bestower of crowns, whose tra traitors are princes, whose merchants are the honored ones of the earth. We don't normally think of merchants as royalty, but these guys were so powerful, you can interpret it a couple of ways. They suggested that you can interpret it that these guys are so commercially successful that they could establish a king on the throne of a country. Or it could be interpreted to say that they were so powerful that the kings only sent their firstborns, the royalty of the family, to Tyre to do the trading deals. But they were extremely influential. They were treated as if they were royalty because the other nations wanted to benefit for their, from their trade. They literally traveled the entire Mediterranean, east and west, and traded with all the countries on the Mediterranean. So they were important enough that everybody paid attention to them. And like I say, that led to them being extremely proud of themselves for it. Okay, Zeta, would you read 9 through 12, please? The Lord Almighty has done it to destroy your pride and show his contempt for all human greatness. Come, Tarshish, sweep over your mother Tyre like the flooding Nile, for the city is defenseless. The Lord holds out his hand over the sea. He shakes the kingdoms of the earth. He has spoken against Phoenicia and depleted its strength. You want 12? 12 too, please. Okay. He says, Never again will you rejoice, O daughter of Zion. Once you were a lovely city, but you will never again be strong. Even if you flee to Cyprus, you will find no rest. Okay. What translation was that? New Living. New Living, okay. Uh, so back to the Holman, verse 9. The Lord of hosts planned it. If you have the New International Version, it says the Lord Almighty. So, like I said, the verse previous to this, verse 8, was a rhetorical question. It was pretty obvious who planned this. It was God. But Isaiah is going to answer his own question. So, again, the Lord of hosts planned this. In some translations, it's the Lord Almighty. In others, it's the Lord Commander of the Armies. The idea being that God is sovereign not only over Judah, but he's sovereign over all the other nations of the world. And he planned it in my Holman to desecrate, desecrate all its glorious beauty, to disgrace all the honored ones of the earth. Read yours again, Zeta. Which number? Uh, the last part of nine. And show his contempt for all human greatness. Okay, just before that. I think it said something about pride. Yeah. The Lord Almighty has done it to destroy your pride. Okay. Remember a while ago I said Tyre's sin was pride? So here it says your glorious beauty. Again, the phrase was referring to pride. They were a beautiful city. It was gilded. It had merchants. They made lots of money. Everybody came and bowed down before them because they wanted to benefit from trade from them. So they got puffed up. 
you want to use some biblical language, they got puffed up, they got prideful, they got boastful. And so they're going to be brought down. In the end of verse 9, it says, to the disgrace all the honored ones of the earth. They were honored. Everybody spoke nicely to them because they wanted to benefit from their trade. And God is going to bring them low. Again, remember, this is forth telling. Didn't really happen until 400 years later, but it's coming. Okay, verse 10 in mind says, Overflow your land like the Nile, daughter of Taurus. There is no longer anything to restrain you. In the whole one, it says, Overflow your land like the Nile. In the New International, it says, Till your land like the Nile. Well, think back to your studies of ancient history. The people of, the Nile, of Egypt lived along the Nile because every year the Nile would flood. And when it flooded, it would fertilize the land and would allow them to grow food. So people were familiar with the flooding. So this is probably best read as an idiom, uh, something that just everybody said because they knew what it meant. And probably this has a couple of possible meanings. It could mean that because of the destruction of Tyre, because of what was coming, the inhabitants of Tyre would overflow the city to escape. They would run away from the city to escape because of the coming judgment. Daughter of Tarish. Tarish is uh, located in Spain. It's uh, identified as an area in Spain, which could either be a commercial rival of Tyre. More likely, it's a outpost of Tyre. Since Tyre is a commercial city, this probably is an indication that they basically controlled all the Mediterranean. So Tyre is located on the eastern side of the Mediterranean, and Tyre is located on the western side of the Mediterranean. So they pretty much control the whole area there. So kind of what they're saying here is when Tyre falls, the outpost over here on the west has no harbor to come to on the east. Because harbors along the eastern side of the Mediterranean are few and far between. There are not that many good harbors. So with the destruction of Tyre, the likelihood is that um, they would not be able to trade as easily on the eastern side as they did before. <laughs> Verse 11, he stretched out his hand over the sea. He made kingdoms tremble. Um, Tyre was a Phoenician city. Phoenicia was known as a seafaring country. They were renowned sailors. In fact, if you'll remember back when we talked about Song of Songs, there is a line in there, and I'm sorry, I didn't go back and look for it, but there is a line in the Song of Songs that talks about um, bringing in jewel and cedars of Lebanon and stuff. It, Solomon had a fleet of ships, one of the few um, kings of Judah who had any shipping commerce activity, and his sailors were all Phoenicians because the Phoenicians were the premier sailors of the day. So they really prided themselves again on being great sailors. And basically Isaiah is saying here, you may be great sailors, but the person who controls the seas is God. He stretches his hand out. He controls everything that happens, and the kingdoms around it will tremble. And he specifically mentions the Canaanite fortresses. Probably this refers back to the Exodus. But if you remember when the children of Israel came into Canaan, they were to destroy all the fortresses. So we all remember the story of Jer uh, Jericho, right? You know, walking around, the walls collapsed. Well, they took other cities like that as well. So this is probably a remembrance to the people who were reading this, that God destroyed the fortresses when they came in. It can also refer to a foretelling to the fortresses of Assyria and Babylon being destroyed because they're also going to be judged. So again, you can look at it both ways. Okay. Um, let's look at 13... And 14. 
Uh, Janice C. 1314. That was fun. I'm looking at you. Oh, because oh. <laughs> we're both Janice C. Oh. <laughs> I have it written down. One was C and one was something else. I'm at, well, Janice Lee. It's okay. Middle name, so if you go. That. Okay, that's where I blew it. All right. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Janice. You get the next one. This is yours. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Thirteen, fourteen. Behold, the land of the I don't know what that word. Chaldeans. Chaldeans. This people was not Tovi. Asian. Asian. Assyrian. Assyrian found it for them that dwell in the wilderness. They set up the towers, therefore, they raised up the palaces, therefore, and he brought it to ruin. How you shipped at Tarn Tarshish. Tarshish, for your strength is laid waste. Yeah, I'm, that's the way I'm going to pronounce it. I don't know if it's right or wrong. <laughs> and eventually I'll figure out which one of you is which. <laughs> Just look at us. Just look, okay. I'll point. At, well, I was just looking at this and wasn't looking at you. <laughs> okay. Look at the land of look at the land of the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans, depending on the translation you're reading, in the New International it says Babylonians. Chaldeans and Babylonians are the same people. It's just depending on which city you're referring to. So they're really the same people. And it says a people who will no longer exist. At this time, Assyria had attacked and destroyed parts of Babylon. Babylon would eventually grow back and destroy Assyria, but so there's some back and forth here. But he's, again, looking forward in time. Um, Assyria would destroy the land of the Chaldeans, would strip his palaces, and basically desolate the land. Babylonian would eventually come back and do the same thing to Assyria. Nice people, these two empires. But notice verse 14, and look at verse 14, and then go back up to verse 1, which I read earlier. Notice anything similar about 1 and 14? Whale on ships of Tarshish. They both say the same thing. It kind of bookends the, the judgment. In both cases, he's saying, you know, well, ships of Tarsus. In one, it says, for your haven has been destroyed. In 14, it says, because your fortress has been destroyed. So he kind of bookends this judgment. Because what he's saying is, again, Tarsus, you're going to lose your trading partner or your home city here in the east. So you're going to be by yourselves. And there's some indication that when Tyre fell, the trade in the Mediterranean declined so that the people of Tarsus had to turn to something besides commerce as a way of making a living. So it, kind of a, a destruction of the entire commercial system in the Mediterranean. Okay, other Janet, <laughs> 15 to 18. And it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten 70 years according to the days of one king. After the end of 70 years shall Tyre sing as an harlot, take, and har take a, an harp, go about the city the a harlot and at last been forgotten, make sweet melodies, sing many songs that thou mayest be remembered. On. Go on. Go on to, end, to the end. Okay. And it shall come to pass after the end of 70 years that the Lord will visit Tyre, and she shall turn to her hire and shall commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. And her merchandise and her hire shall be holiness to the Lord. It shall not be treasured nor laid up. For her merchandise shall be for them that dwell before the Lord to eat sufficiently and for durable clothing. Okay. Holman 15 says, On that day Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years, the lifespan of one king. 
there's a couple of ways you can interpret this. Biblical scholars, I found at least two, if not more, different ways you can read this. Or, or what it refers to, maybe I should say. Uh, the 70 years will actually be the number of years that the nation of Judah goes into exile, which is in the future. That's Isaiah would be foretelling, or foretelling. You'd be talking about the future. Because when Assyria captures them and they go into exile, they're gone for 70 years. That could be one way of interpreting it. The other way of interpreting it that's given is because 70 is a multiple of 7, and 7 is a perfect number, it could be interpreted as this is the perfect amount of time that it takes God to judge the city and bring it back to its restoration. So you can take your pick which one you'd rather have. It's either referring to Judah's exile, or it could be referring to perfect time it takes for judgment and restoration to occur. At the end of 70 years, what's the song say, what the song says about the prostitute will happen to Tyre? Pick up your heart in the through of the city, prostitute forgotten by men, placed skillfully. Sing many a song, and you will be thought of again. Uh, evidently, the reference in 15 about uh, the song of the prostitute, it's a local favorite for the time. I guess part of the top 10 on the music scale or something. It's a song that everybody knew. We don't, but Isaiah helps. He gives you some of the lines that he's talking about in verse 16. And again, the way it's generally interpreted is the idea that after 70 years, Tyre has been forgotten, and it needs to come up with a way of letting people know we're here again for business. And that's kind of, if you look at the verse 16, this is what it's talking about with the prostitute. You know, you no longer have any business, so you become a musician in order for people to recognize that you're back in business, so they'll come see you. Well, Tyre's going to have to do the same thing. They're going to have to come up with a way of advertising themselves to come back. Because in 17, it says, at the end of 70 years, the Lord will restore Tyre. So 70 years destruction, and then they're going to come back. Problem is, they did not learn their lesson. Look at the rest of 17. She'll go back into business, prostituting herself with all the kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth. This doesn't mean God doesn't like business. It simply means in this context that they're going to go back to their old ways. They're going to go back to, we're doing business with the world, we're making money, we are the best in the world, we are the greatest. You know, the Muhammad Ali quote, I am the greatest, for those old enough to remember Muhammad Ali. Um, the quote, I am the greatest, they're back again. I am the greatest. Now there is one change. Notice at verse uh, 18, but her prophets and wages will be dedicated to the Lord. They will not be stored or saved, for a prophet will go to those who live in the Lord's presence to provide them with apple food and sacred clothing. There's indication here that the prophets of Tyre, once they are restored, while they are prideful of what they can do, some of their prophets would actually be used or dedicated to Judah's God. And again, how is this actually fulfilled? Well, again, most Bible biblical scholars say you look at it and look at the book of Ezra when Ezra restores the temple. Some of the building materials to restore the temple in Ezra's time after the exile come from Tyre. So some of their prophets, some of their building materials are used to restore the temple. So this could be an interpretation of what's happening or what's being foretold. It may not be. Think about what it is. But um, God's going to judge Tyre just like he's going to judge all those other nations as judgment on the nations. And some of them will come back because when we get to New Testament time, Tyre and Sidon are mentioned in New Testament time as well. So they're back in back in business at this point. They have been restored. So the judgment here is that your sins 
will be judged by God regardless of whether or not you are Judah or whether or not you're one of the other nations in the area. God is sovereign. God reigns over everything and controls everything for the future. So any anybody have a note or something that stood out to you when you were looking at the lesson? I know a couple of you looking at notes look like in your in your Bibles. Did anything jump out at you that in the notes that I didn't hit on? Okay, I'm not hearing anything then. <laughs> Once in a while, you know, Beverly has done it a couple of times. She has a note that really adds to it. Well, just... there's some, the only thing that I saw was, you know, they refer to this prostitute all the time. Mm -hmm. And he's really not talking about prostitutes as much as that describes their commerce. Their, mm -hmm. all their, they're into everything for profit. Yeah. A lot of times in the Old Testament, when you talk about prostitution, they're really just talking about immorality of any type. Right. I mean, sometimes it's literally prostitution. But in this case, the prostitution is the immorality of the city and the pride of the city. And the business, yeah. So it's kind of a buzzword to mean just immorality in general. It said a prostitute nation was one that sought to make the highest profits regardless of how they got them, yeah. you know. Okay, well then let's close with prayer. I hear him practicing upstairs. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your lesson today. Ask that as we go into the worship service, that you be with Mike and the praise team and others that are going to be involved. Uh, help us to hear your word, and may we apply it to our lives. Thank you for the lesson this morning. I just ask that you help us to see that you are the sovereign Lord. You are the one that controls all of human history. Help us to praise you for it and to realize that your way is the way we should go. Help us to, to walk in it. For we ask it in your name. Amen.